Good morning, everybody. It is my great pleasure to today introduce uh, a wonderful local, Andrew Barr, owner and operator of the Liquorland on La Nef. Uh, many of you may have stopped by already and uh, received his wonderful advice on uh, kind of gifts and other things that you might want to buy in a liquid form. Um, <laughs> but uh, yes, so Andrew was born in 1961 on a farm in South Taranaki and uh, after going to Australia for a short period of time he joined uh, the wine industry in 1984. So he's been in the industry pretty much all of my life. So he's a fountain of knowledge, a really amazing bloke, a great contribution to the uh, local community and we are so very happy to have him here. Andrew. Thanks, Mirko, for your, for your kind words. My mum would be chuffed, eh? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much for the opportunity, guys. Um, yeah, it's been an interesting, interesting ride up until today. So, born in South, in South Taranaki, grew up. My uh, surname is Barr, and I grew up on a, on a sheep farm that they converted to, um, to dairying when I was 12 years old. So, it was quite interesting. We, we were not only one of the few Protestant families in the, um, in the community, we were the only, only, only sheep farm as well. Um, then my mum went on to become the um, head of uh, music and drama at the local high school while I was there. So at a very um, young age I learned how to, to um, run more than 50 metres pretty quickly and what have you. It wasn't easy being the teacher's kid, you know, so that's right. It's for who I credit for um, being able to negotiate a sale and talk to people. So it was, um, yeah, an interesting, an interesting upbringing. The point I wanted to make is, man, it wasn't the world different then. So many things that we take absolutely for granted to um, today, and, and just working through the Dubai today, you know, things that are roughly different, the impact on um, on uh, technology, uh, phones, laptops, you know, yada yada yada, e-commerce, power steering. <laughs> Do you remember when that when power steering came in? I remember when power steering and someone had to explain air conditioning to me. What you got a fridge in your car? Well, that's some neat technology, you know. And then radios would actually select a channel for you. That's just incredible stuff, you know. And now. We just bamboozled with uh, with new stuff that's coming through all the um, coming through all of the uh, the time. Um, it was interesting when I was as I was the teachers the teachers kid. I pretty much rejected education. I I just passed five subjects in um, in school C. I failed UE, and um, I started retailing a part of rubber when I was 18 years old. Um, I've always been a very deep uh, very deep thinker, and I sat down at the end of one night after work after about eight months. Uh, I've been working hard all day. I was very, um, very striking in my shorts and my board shorts, my, my shorts and long, uh, long socks and sandals. Remember that, boys? Yeah. yeah. Wasn't, that, wasn't that fun? Yeah. Um, <coughs> and I sat down with a pen and paper and I worked out that I was uh, 19 years old. I'd have to save for 20. For, I'd have to save for 20 years to buy a car that was 30 years old. And I thought there's got to be something better. Um, and I had an uncle uh, who lived in Australia, so I, I, um, I moved to where uh, I was in, um, in 1981. I was very fortunate I became a, a Pizza Hut uh, trainee manager and I uh, cooked pizza happily for a for three years. And that was really good because it, it taught you how to think on your feet. Um, it was, it was a, a great bit of experience because you're dealing with large numbers of people and it literally was not, not like a KFC pressure cook situation, but it was. There's a lot of people coming in, a lot of um, working with expectations. And that's when I really learned about how you've got to deliver on customers' expectations. And I'll never forget the time there was a um, there was a guy coming with his girlfriend for a meal before um, before the movies. Decent looking, decent looking uh, guy. Um, sat down at the um, sat down at the meal, placed the order and what have you, and you guessed it, the kitchen managed to muck up the pizza order. So I was the I was the duty manager that night. So I walked out and I said, oh, good evening sir, I'm Andrew, I'm the duty manager for the evening. I'm very sorry, we've um, we've mucked up your, um, your pizza order. And he just went ballistic. Said, oh, for God's sakes, that's the third time that's happened on this. Bed. I hate coming here. Da, da, da. And I said, look, hey, just calm down, mate. If, you, if you've got somewhere urgently to go, I can get you a pasta meal out here in about um, about five minutes. But the um, the pizza's going to take you 15. And he stood up and word for his please excuse me. He said, mate, you can stick it up your ass. And I thought, my goodness, how am I going to deal with that? I genuinely inquired, inquired and I said, sir, would that, be the, would that be the pasta meal or the pizza? <laughs> <laughs> the reaction for the restaurant told me that it was a good way of diffusing the situation, but that's when I learned how hey, you've got to take something seriously when you're dealing with, uh, you're dealing with, um, with customers. The other one that, that, uh, that's hit home recently, and it was when I, when I first put my store down at, um, at, uh, at Takanini, and um, if you ever want to see a slice of life, I suggest you start retailing in South Auckland. It, uh, it was funny, games. Um, 
group of young guys came in, dressed to the nines, what have you, Wednesday, and I said, oh my God, you boys, you look fantastic. You know, what's going on today? Very happy. And one of them said, well, as it was Dad's funeral, we thought we'd better dress up a bit. And I thought, hmm, there are a lot of drivers for people coming into a, to a liquor store, so let's make sure that we, uh, we don't let customers, we don't let customers down. Um, in my presentation, I said that I was going to talk about a number of, um, I was going to talk about a number of uh, points. Uh, my topic I chose was delivering beating hearts to surgeons. So clearly, when you re when you when you're retailing and you're retailing liquor, you're not delivering beating hearts to, to surgeons. But the circumstances that drive people coming into the shop are bloody important when they uh, when they come along. So we do take we do take things very seriously. We need we need to make sure that you can get the right the right liquid for the right price when you bleed it. It's cold and uh, etc. to run to work uh, uh, so that we can deliver on what you what, what you uh, what you need. My point is that. We don't take ourselves too seriously, but we take our customers very seriously. Okay? There's a lot of serious things we're working through, interest rates and yada, 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 but we've got to make sure that we're, um, that we're taking care of your needs and what have you and, uh, and not disappoint you. Um, just, working, just working through, there's a number of changes happening with, with retail. Some of them positive, some of them not as consumer, chase, uh, consumer taste change. There's also some um, some uh, major legal changes that are happening, particularly around the sale and supply of, um, of alcohol. And I just wanted to pass on how seriously this is taken by the um, by liquor men, in particular, which I have I have direct experience with, and by the industry in, um, in general. So I run a licensed premise, so I've, I've got to I've got to conform to certain to certain educational standards. So I understand um, I understand. Uh, the requirements to actually to actually purchase liquor, and it's not just age. We've got to make we've got to make sure that we're checking that people aren't intoxicated. That's um, that's absolutely verboten. And some of the things I can't I can't help put a grin on my face is they give you a framework <coughs> for intoxication. So you know if if people are showing signs of anger, they may be intoxicated. Okay, they may just had a bad day, but they may be intoxicated. If people are, are, um, are, are very boisterous, they may be in, in, uh, intoxicated. If people are very upset, they may be um, intoxicated. Um, it's interesting that when I did the same, the same study in, um, in Australia, um, one of the parameters in Australia we had to look for was the loss of control of bodily fluids. Now, we, we, <laughs> we don't have that parameter in, uh, in New Zealand, but we take it very seriously. I mean, you may not realise when you go in, when you go into the go into, uh, into all, any of the liquor land stores that everybody gets age verified. The person, the staff member is asked, is this person going to, and we say this is the person going to be over 25. Now, when when we are, when when the staff member is unsure that someone is, is over 25, we ask for ID. Now the legal age is 18, but it's 25 is the benchmark that, um, that we use. Um, when we're unsure, we ask for ID. If we don't get ID, we have to refuse. We have to refuse service. When we do get ID, we record the birth date so that it's there, and all of that, all of that recording is uh, is done, so that we can check the number of people that we are IDing. Now, seven and a half percent of the population of New Zealand is between is between uh, 18 and 25 years old. So if we're not IDing seven and a half percent of the population, we're not doing our jobs, and so we're constantly making sure that we are checking that uh, we're checking that ID. And it's a very, very real, a very real concern. Now at Ellerslie, I've never had anyone that has that has been underage. But what head office do to reinforce this? We've got a sting operation that goes around. They will send people in that are between eighteen and twenty-five, and they'll, they will they'll be asked for ID. And if they don't furnish the ID, um, then then um, and we serve them, then the store gets fined. Now it's a protection measure, measure for, um, for, uh, for the store. So um, the first time, it, the first time it happens, it costs you five hundred bucks. The second time, it costs you a grand. But it, it doesn't happen the first time because it's written into all of our employment agreements. Take age very seriously. Take intoxication very seriously. And the point I'm making this is it really, it really flows into what I call our social license. Now selling liquor, selling a selling a substance like ethanol is a privilege it really is and we do take it damn, damn, damn seriously even though it's fun that it makes you giggle and yada 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 um, we do take it very seriously and we like to and we like to think that above all we are responsible corporate uh, we're responsible uh, corporate citizens um, the other point i just wanted to, wanted to make is that there's some changes that are, that are going on um, the blunt avenue store is quite quite interesting when you compare it to other liquor stores or other liquor land stores as some um, as well 
When I designed the store, I designed it after running a store in Takanini for, uh, for uh, two and a half years. In Takanini, 30% of my sales were, were RTD, 20% were rum or beer, so half my business was coming through a chiller. 30% was, uh, sorry, 35% was wine, and about 10%, sorry, 30% was full strength spirits, and about 10% was, um, was wine. So I designed the store, the great big chiller, and what have you. I've turned around, and what's happening in this neck of the woods is that, that Beer is becoming a very small part of people's alcohol repertoire. So I've got one product in the store that's Pals, it's an RTD. Now, all due respect to one of Pals, it's a very popular drink, but it's a, it's a, 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 um, a vodka-based um, fruit-flavoured drink mixed with soda water that I find quite light in flavour. People say it's low in, low in calorie. That one product delivers more sales for me than Heineken, Steinlager, Spates, uh, any lime branded product combined, it's just phenomenal to see to see that, there's ch that the uh, the, the consumer chase uh, tastes are, uh, are changing at the rate that they that they are, and it's a good thing that younger people coming through are drinking are drinking less alcohol in in total, but they're drinking more premium and they're drinking different uh, they're drinking different drinks, drinks certainly to the drinks that I that I young uh, first uh, grew up with. I mean, one of the the big, the big drivers of making alcohol uh, more consumable has been sugar. And this is really what's driven the RTD revol uh, revolution that started uh, very early in the very early 80s. Um, how do you make a, a drink a more, uh, more drinkable? Well, you add sugar to it, you sweeten it, and you mask the flavor of, you mask the, flavor of, the, um, of the alcohol. So RTDs came along, quite sweet RTDs like, um, like Vodka Cruise and what have you, uh, have, uh, have come along. And they're very, very drinkable drinks, but they don't actually taste too much like alcohol. And it's almost a concern to see that the amount of the, the amount of those that have been selling that are a full strength alcoholic beverage that are more alcoholic than, um, than beer, that are being seen as a health alternative to beer, but, but you know, people forget that people dwell on the fact that, the, uh, that, the, uh, that there's low sugar in the, in the drink. <coughs> but they forget the biggest driver of calories in any in any um, liquor is alcohol. By its very definition, any stored energy is a calorie. And so people say, "I'm drinking, I'm drinking this drink, what have you, because it's a low sugar drink, therefore it's better for me." But they forget the fact that it's five or six percent, and there is stored calories in it too. Um, to do so, um, health and life and uh, lifestyle and well-being is one of the huge drivers of um, of consumption of, of the beverages that we um, that we have. And it flows right across all light tonics are very, very, uh, are very popular with um, with gin. Low alcohol, uh, sorry, lower alcohol and lower carb beers are, are the only beer categories that are growing. All the premium beers um, um, and craft beers are actually stacking and slightly and slightly declining. A because of price, but B because of the perception of beer is bad because it's it's, it's got sugar and most of all it's got carbohydrates. It's 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 changing. The now, before I started, I should have I should have made one um, should have made one point abundantly clear. And as this is as this is being, being recorded, I have to reinforce this point. What I'm presenting to you this morning are my opinions. Okay, I'm not here on behalf of foodstuffs. I'm certainly not here on behalf of uh, of Liquorland. This is uh, this is the opinions of Andrew Barr after a lot of years of um, of retailing. Um, and I'm just I'm just reminded of the um, of the words of my of my dad. He he was he always used to say that opinions are like bottoms. We've all got one, but it's a silly man that bears them in public. Okay, <laughs> so, so they're my views. I'm certainly not presenting a view on the um, on the industry that has come from. Yes, there's some industry knowledge and in working with people. That's not that's not based based on anything that's uh, that, that's uh, that is a uh, a foodstuff a foodstuff view. Um, Surviving ram raids. These are a bugger. They really are. Ram raids. Ram raids. And I've had three at the um, at the store. I've had th and it's been trading for um, two years and three months. So three ram raids and two and two uh, break-ins. This is a, this has been a really confronting situation to um, to work through. And I just wanted to, to to sort of bring you on the journey that I that I went through with um, with ram raids. First of all, I set the store up and I completely focused on making this as visually as appealing as I um, as I could. <coughs> I find it interesting that after working for, for almost 20 years in, um, in corporate, um, I uh, was in the situation where I was able to be made redundant for a role and I thought, great, I'm not happy with the New Zealand industry, I'm going to bugger off back to Australia and be, um, and be happy. 
But I thought, no, there's a couple of questions I've got. So I went to university for a, for a year. Now, I was the oldest student in the room. I find it, found it absolutely fascinating to be actually studying consumer behaviour, the drivers of, of, um, of retail purchase, what, what spins customers' wheels, and how we create the, the, the right environment for, um, for retail. So I used a lot of that science when I designed the store. So visually, it was great. I didn't realise that all of the lighting would actually attract Ram Raiders as well, but it certainly did. So um, you know, we were set up and um, and and, uh, and ready to um, ready to go. Um, so the first time that I was for, um, that I was hit with a Ram Raider, it just it just exposed to me exactly how um, ill prepared we were in a, in a security sense. We weren't set up with the right the right number of bollards, etc. And so you know, we were we were absolutely right for the um, for the picking. Um, and by the time we had the um, by the time we had the um, the second ram raid on the 17th of, um, of September, we were a lot more we were a lot more prepared um, than after the first one. But really, having it was only six weeks after the um, after the first one that it, that it happened. It was still it was still a hell of a shock. And I don't know if you if you Google me, and you'll, you'll see some of the footage I was on TV. And yes, I was that bloody shocked. And I've, I've now learned to brush my hair before I go on TV. It was a, a shocking morning to be uh, to be part of. Um, but. It was really the process after the ram raid that um, that, that it really that has really had the, the, the most lasting um, impact on me. The first of all was was that um, I realised the psychological toll that it um, that it takes. Because I was angry as hell. I really, I really was. And I had a, I had a temper like that. It was, you know, and I, I thought, what's going on? I was busy, and I'm working a few too many hours, and I've had COVID and whatever. But it was really the whole concept of someone coming in and just taking stuff away with, um, without asking. And I thought, well, okay, we'll get some counselling for that. We understand that. Okay, put that into, into perspective. But then I went through the restorative justice process, and it reinforced to me just how under-resourced we are as a um, as a society to deal with this, um, to deal with the problem. Because I met the crims that did the um, the second the second ram raid. Now the first one was it was a kid that was 14 years old, and it was pretty much every stereotype you've seen in, um, you've, you've seen on TV. Uh, 14 years old. Poor education, struggled at um, at school. One of six kids. Mum was 32 years old. Uh, one of the one of the parents was in jail. Like it was just it was just a uh, it was it was a train wreck. You could see waiting to happen. He had he had four representatives in the room from a from the local local um, Marae, the local um, the, um, the uh, police and defence were there, as, which was good. You know, it was a 14 year old kid after all. Working, working through, uh, working through that situation. It was just confronting to see, yeah, this kid was, um, this kid was uh, on a track that wasn't going to be, uh, wasn't going to be particularly good. And I went in angry and what have you, and I should lock them up. And you know, da, da, da. I thought, hang on a second, the kid's 14 years old. You know, I made a few mistakes. I certainly knew not to steal at 14 years old. I knew not to steal at at, um, at two years old. But uh, 14 years old, there's a few, there's a few drivers that are, um, that, are that are causing, that are causing that. And I thought, right, well. This is uh, this isn't good enough. And so uh, when they when they said to me, you know, what sort of uh, compensation do you seek from uh, from uh, for the uh, perpetrator of this crime? I thought, the kid's 14 years old. Come on, the compensation I wanted is to get him back to school. Let's get the things going. Get him into a footy team. Try and get. The things that I took as normal back into there, but then you realise that it's not normal for people. Okay, so I dealt with the 14 year old, that was a, that was a tough one. Then the 18 year old, this was this was a real come to Jesus, 18 years old. This kid would have been 45 kilos ringing wet, absolutely ringing wet. Talked through the situation, he was there with his, he was there with his son, with his mum, and uh, his mum handed him a, a statement which was uh, which is an apology. And the first thing he says, Mum, you know I can't read that. And I thought, bloody hell, the kids are literate. This is dreadful. And I says, this is another bad situation that we've got. 18 years old, he's bloody old. <coughs> what a terrible situation to, um, to, to be in. So uh, we worked through the we worked through the uh, the meeting, what have you, and this profound apology and what have you, most of which I um, I believe. Um, and uh, once again, they said, you know, what sort of conversation we're looking for? And I said, well, simple, get the kid in school. Let's get some education to start with. Let's get that basis and what have you. Son, let's see. Four months go by and the, and the lawyer phones me and said, listen, he's coming up for sentencing. Can he do anything in the shop to compensate for what he's, for what he's done? I said, look, he can't work in the shop. He's 18 years old. He doesn't have any qualifications. Whatever. But look, there's some, there's some stuff I can do. I'll get a water blaster and we'll do some cleaning up and what have you. So um, we'll get that going next week or what have you. 
And at that time I said to her, um, how's he going with his reading? And she said, what do you mean? He reads really well. I said, what do you mean he couldn't read the statement in court? She said, oh, no, 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 he re he's fluent in Toreo, he just can't read English. <laughs> now, dual, dual language, I think, is a noble thing, it's a wonderful thing, but who hijacks a kid's future for that sort of thing, to have him fluent in Toreo, but not to be able to fill in a, an employment contract, a bank loan, uh, anything like that can be, can be done without the assistance of a special. Of a, of, of special. Now, Please don't think this is a, a political a political view, but hey, something something's gone wrong if we've if we've let that uh, let that happen. So um, yeah, that's that's not a, that's not a good situation. Then the sentencing comes along, and the, the guy you know so so I'm, the sentencing couldn't be done in, couldn't be done in, in the city because it was too, the court was too busy. It had to be done down in Pukekohe, so I rostered the staff on, rostered myself off for half a day, get to Pukekohe, get to Pukekohe at um, at uh, ten o'clock in the morning. No show. Oh, this is damn annoying. So the lawyer's phone goes, I'll be there this afternoon at 2 o'clock. Like, what am I doing in Coe for four hours? So I'm waiting down there, change the roster and what have you. Another 80 hours, 80 hours cost, 30 bucks an hour, what have you, get down there. 2 o'clock, no, uh, no show as well. And I thought, hmm, is this young man taking the situation seriously? And they had a parent down here and a parent up there, and you know, there's family stuff happens and traffic and cars break down. And, you know, my patience was getting shorter and shorter and shorter. Um, and what really was the trigger for a run for me was the, the magistrate was a little bit um, frustrated. Um, and uh, it came up that the magistrate, magistrate said, um, this, is, this is just not good enough for this, um, for this young man. He said, did he do this on his own or was he acting with, with other people? And he was speaking to the prosecutor, my daddy. And the prosecutor said, did this, said, acting on his own. Uh, uh, it went on for like 30 seconds. I'm at the back of the court and I said, look, Your Honour, can I add some perspective here? And he said, oh, who might you be? I said, well, I'm the victim here. You know, I've got the eye in the store that, um, that happened. And I said, I can tell you from the CCTV footage, there were three of them that, uh, that came into the store. So, oh, very good. And uh, that went into the notes and what have you. And then, it, um, and then it went through. So the prosecution didn't have the information about the other cases. They had one prosecution. They can't put the sequence together. Okay, so how are we going to fix the problem? We can't link it, link it to one together. So that, that's gone through when he seen us in about a, in about a month's time. And um, then I met the 24-year-old, and I thought, this is going to be interesting because he's, because he's an adult. And he was a little bit cockier than the others. Um, uh, still very, very well-schooled apology, very well-schooled. Well you know, I'm really sorry, I'm trying to get my life back in, back in order and what have you. I haven't been able to work. Um, he'd had his wife and, and uh, two young kids in the room. No one, one was four, one was, one was two. You know, it was a family man. Um, we, you know, this is a completely random act. You know, when I first got ram right, I thought, right, this is the gang stealing to order. There was only particular brands that, uh, that went. That wasn't the case. It was pretty random, what have you. Um, and you know, I'm very, very sorry for, um, for for what went on. And you know, it was a, it was a stupid thing to um, thing to do. And it, and it was a completely it was. And he used the term. He said it was a completely random act. And I sat there and I thought, and I said to him, it was a completely random act. Yes, Mr. Bar, it was whatever. And I said, the only thing I can't believe your about your story is the tense. And he said, What do you mean, the tense? And I said, Well, you called it a random act. He said, Yeah, it was a random act. And I said, No, it was random acts, plural, not singular. He said, Oh, what do you mean by that? And I said, Well, it was a random act when you broke into the store, and it was a random act when you dro broke into the into the plumber's van to steal the sledgehammer. That you then ran it randomly went out your car three times because the crowbar didn't work on the cigarette cabinet, and you went inside to get the to get the crowbar. So it wasn't a random act. This was <coughs> this was something that you'd given some thought to. Someone had done some thought and some planning to have a crowbar and to have it. You know, you stole a car. Were you lucky to have a crowbar in the boot? Perhaps I'm a very believing fellow, but I don't believe that. Were you lucky to have a sledgehammer in the boot? I don't believe that for one bloody second take it from there. But all of those points weren't available to the people who were running through and doing the prosecution to say, hey, this is what's, uh, what's going on. Now, at the end of the day, 24-year-old 24 24-year-old 24 bloke, he's made a really dumb decision. He didn't have any prior charges and what have you. So the thing with the with restorative justice is you get to sit, you get to eyeball the, um, you get to eyeball the, uh, the crimp, but you also get to see some of the life circumstances, but you also get the chance to actually give you a view on what sort of, what sort of penalty that you can apply. And so I'm sitting across from this arrogant young guy, 
with his arms crossed staring at me and they said, are you in favour of a custodial sentence? And I said, I get a view, I get a view of whether or not time, this, this young man spends time in, um, in jail. Yes, your, your opinion will be heard and we read by the court. And so my view about him going to jail, she said, yes, do you, are you in favour of, of a custodial sentence? And I said, absolutely, this guy should get locked up. The look on his face was the reason that I um, said it, but I then said, he should get locked up. The second time he does this, <laughs> this is what should happen. But we all make mistakes, I said. All we're doing by, by locking people up is we've got mum here, we've got four and two years old. What happens to them? What was what was working in the background? This kid did the, this this 24 year old did the burglary on the uh, did the breaking on the 17th of, of September. That meeting happened in in April, and he'd been inside all that all that time. You know, as, and you can say well, he's, he's broken the law; he should have been inside. But you know, there's also there's, you've also got to have some sort of um, thought for what happens with the uh, with the families and what have you. Now, am, am I soft on crime? No, I'm not. You know, um, I'm absolutely against uh, against um, I'm against uh, crime and I'm against uh, thieving and what have you. But the other thing I've, that I that I found really difficult at the time, and this is this is please, this is not a political comment. That was tough to deal with. Look, bloody hell, New Zealand's changed. Not a great not a great uh, thing to um, to see. The other thing that I had to deal with was the news every night, because I sat there at the news every night and I saw the government of the, of the time saying, no, retail crime, we're big on retail crime, there's millions of dollars going into, um, into security measures and having people are safe in their workplace and everything's being taken care of. And I thought, oh, hang on a second, what about me? And I thought, well, the first ram ride on the, 6th of, on the 6th of August, while there was this propaganda on, um, on television, or the second ram ride on the 17th of September, and I thought, right, I'm going to find the hotline here. I need some help and what have you. So I Googled the hotline. I went looking for the hotline. I spoke to Liquorland Head Office. I spoke to every bugger that I could. There was no hotline. There was absolutely no contact available for the, um, for the retailer. So where was this money going? It was fantasy. What, what happened was that after about seven weeks, the police contacted me and said, have you got more than five staff? No, I don't. Therefore, you qualify for some for some assistance. What can we do? This was six weeks after the ram raid. Now, the day after my second ram raid, I spent eight grand on my second fog cannon. I upgraded. I put in a, I put in a strobe light. And I put in a siren. What have you? And I put in a panic room. Okay, because ram, ram raids are bad. Aggravated robberies are worse, and that's my that's my biggest concern. That's what I lose sleep about now. But what we were told was absolutely not was was happening. So then I went through the process and I have, and I'm not too proud to say, I have accepted some government assistance for some security measures. I've now got metal grills on my front of the store and I've got a third fog cannon. So I have three fog cannons in the, door, in the, in the store. I also got to see the quotes that were signed off on for the, um, for the installation of the fog cannons. And it was fully 80% dearer with lower specs than what I put in myself. So not only were we told that everything was being done, that was, was being done, was there, we're protecting people and yada, yada, yada. But when it was done, the expression I use is a drunken sailor of a $2 brothel. It was done so quickly, let's get it done and get it done, that I don't think there was a necessary process that was used. Even though you're being, you're being protected, you're being protected was seven months when it was installed. Okay? So it's made me a little bit skeptical about what I'm told on um, TV every every night. This is not a political, not a political situation. Nothing happens in, um, in isolation. This situation has developed over many, many years. Okay? But that's the landscape. It's not, it's not an easy situation to, um, to deal with or to, um, or to rectify. So retail crime is a bit close to my is close to my heart. I'm sorry, it's still it still brasses me off and makes me uh, and makes me a little angry. Um, and that's just the way that uh, the way that it's going to it's going to be. We're protected, and we're a great we're a great retail site. Enough of that, okay? So enough of that. People do find it a bit, a bit interesting. Um, liquor retailing, I've spoken about ram raids, working with food stuff, go food stuffs. Um, the poor old grocer in New Zealand has been getting a hiding in the uh, in the press. And yes, there's a lot of money a lot of money um, tied up in um, in the grocery retailing in um, in New Zealand, and it's easy to. Once, a guy once gave me a, a great piece of advice. It's easy to stand on top of a hill and shout at people. It's much different when you're standing alongside a bloke and talking to him. I've worked with foodstuffs now for, for over 20 years, and I've worked on both sides of the counter. I've been the supplier. I've been. I worked for a major corporate. I've, I've been in to see foodstuffs when their products had more than 15% market share. I've been in the, the foodstuffs when we've got tiny little brands that we're um, doing. And I can tell you, they are hard. 
They are absolutely hard, and they let you know what the processes are. But the guys, the guys act in a way, in the way that I've, the way I was, I've, the question I've always asked myself when I'm dealing with a negotiator, is this person behaving differently, more unfairly than I would be in that chair? Now, I can honestly say with foodies, I, I don't think so. Yes, they're hard, they've got a job to do, and they drive price, and they are, they are a profitable organisation. But they're not dishonest, they don't misuse market, market power, um, and they do other things for New Zealand that, that I think get lost on the, um, on the community. Um, and one of the, it's one of the great differences. I lived I live in Australia for around 20, 20 years. I, I, I bloody love it, I really do. One of the big differences with Australia and New Zealand is the location of the population. They're very coastal centric and what have you, and they're a way more urban society than uh, the, what, what, uh, what we are. And a lot of it's to do with the way the economy is shaped. Now, like it or not, we've got a huge part of New Zealand's GDP tied up with about 10,000 individuals and dairy farmers, okay? Now, thank goodness those farms are located from, from Kaitaia to, um, to Blast. So we've got the wealth of New Zealand spread right through the, through the country. It's one of the big, the big differences. And this is also similar to the, to the grocery market because those people, those people all eat and so we've got those businesses. Now, with foodstuffs, we've got independent businesses, the guy that owns the store, the guy that owns New World or Packerside runs the store. So all of those businesses have got services there. They've got accountants, they've got tax accountants, they've got auditors on the tax accountants, they've got auditors on the tax accountants auditors, they've got banking specialists, they've got all sorts of support services what have you, that are behind each one of those businesses, opposed to the corporate model with Woolworths. Big head office, everybody on staff and what have you. Now you can say, hey, that's a way more efficient model. Or you can say, hey, there's a whole lot of jobs spread throughout New Zealand that make a difference. So when you go to fielding and you deal with the field local footy team, who's going to be who's going to be the treasurer of the footy club? Who's going to be the people that have got real professional um, who have got professional training in the um, in those uh, in those communities? Who are the people that can contribute to the fabric of New Zealand? Those are the those are the people that are employed in services and what have you. Now, that's one of the benefits of the foodstuffs model. The guys that own the store runs the store. They wouldn't look at it it's slightly different. You can own it. You can own multiple sites. I've only got, I've had two little end stores and as much as I find music in a spreadsheet, I find no joy in it. I love running one, running one store. But the point is that all of those services that, that I need, I have to pay for and that employs a lot of, uh, lot of chemists as, um, as, as well. So yes, um, our grocery price is higher in New Zealand. Yes, they are. Um, then other, other comparisons. Um, do we need um, a major uh, German based public, a uh, major German based um, family company coming to New Zealand to open up and compete with them. Well, it may drive prices down, but what's it really going to do? We'll get our beans what, cheaper and what have you. Uh, we may get other prices cheaper, but hang on, what happened to the job? Where's the accountant's job gone? Where's the lawyer's got job gone? How's that contract being viewed, etc., etc.? So there are some benefits that are run that we, that we, don't, uh, that we, don't, we don't see. So how is, it, how is it dealing with foodies? They're tough. They make you jump, they make you jump through hoops, but they're all the hoops that you absolutely have to jump through. Employment contracts, okay? Now just understand this point. When the pressure first started coming on um, immigration fraud affecting, affecting liquor stores in New Zealand, the comment was made, it's a publicly noted comment, that 40%, 40% of all people working in liquor stores were not being paid fairly, okay? The immigration um, fraud was a big part of it. 40% of it was there. Every one of my, every one of my, of, uh, every one of my staff has an employment contract. Now you may think that that is absolutely the most basic thing in the world to say, but it's not the case in a lot of the, a lot of the businesses that have been out there. There've been huge strides made. That's not been an issue with the liquor land because we're foodstuffs owned. And believe me, to get through to the stage of wearing the green badge, you've got a hell of a lot of work to do in terms of justifying your character and your financial background. But some of the stores that are out there, you have to be sceptical of what's going on. And as Kiwis, we love shopping for a bargain. When I'm shopping for something, I say, am I paying too much for this? And I ask, am I paying too little for it? Now, it really drives home when you throw parallel imports um, uh, into, the, um, into the equation. If things are at ridiculously low prices, someone is funding that discount. And there's been there have been lots and lots of cases. Just just Google immigration fraud New Zealand liquor store, and you'll see people within a couple of cases of me that have taken advantage of, um, of people. So don't pay too much for your boots, but don't pay too little for it as, uh, as well. I'm getting the wind up. Okay, so 
as I said, we don't deliver beating hearts to surgeons. One of the big differences with my store is the, uh, is the, is the people that I have in the store. I work the store uh, five days a week. I've learnt this new concept of days off, but I'm there every day apart from Tuesday and Wednesday. I train my staff, I pay my staff, I look after my staff. We're also intimately acquainted with most of the liquids there. If someone comes into the store and they say to me, what's it like? You can be absolutely guaranteed that if I offer an opinion, I'll say, uh, this is what I think of the liquid, this is the competitive set, this is where I think it fits. If I say, um, I don't know, it's because I haven't tasted it. The 3,000 products in that store are last count of the 2,200 I have tasted. So there's a lot of products that we do. We do th something different. So when we make a recommendation, we like to think it's from an informed basis. We give service, we recognise people, we work with the community and what have you. We're very price competitive because we are owned by foodies and what have you by foodies. They don't let you um, get, do silly things with, um, with price, which is good. So we can be, you can be assured that when you come in, the other difference that we um, that we have is we really focus on what I call liquid on lips. Every day of the week, I've got 12 malt whiskies and 15 gins open for tasting. There's always wines there to try. If you wanted to try something new and in, in anything in the liquor in the liquor um, um, uh, sphere, do pop in and see us. Happy, so I appreciate the time. Okay. So I'm sorry about the ram, about ram raids and what have you. Yeah, it's close to my heart, but so is the fact that hey, we've been told some things that haven't been correct, and you know, let's try and fix things by lighting people thing, lighting people up. Mm. We've got some work to do across the board. So, yeah, thank you. Just before we finish up, any questions? Number two. Um, my partner is a big fan of Pals. What would you say is the, uh, the when, when, did, when, when did it start taking off and why? Um, Pal, Pals is a really interesting one. Um, I should know, but I don't know. Uh, I have met the owners of Pals. One of them is a really prominent radio personality, and so it was probably the best, probably the best example of, of social media impacting a, um, a product. They were very hot with social media. It went out, it went viral very quickly, and so a lot of people knew about it um, very, very quickly. In the old supermarket days, when I was when I was supplying supermarkets, used to get used to get twelve weeks for the product, get distribution, get sales, get performance on uh, on promotion. Now, if an RTD is not performing in two weeks for me, it's on the deletion trail because the social media just drives that uh, drives the demand so quickly. So yes, it was different. Yes, it was lower calorie. Some people love the um, some people love the stuff. So there's a consumer need out there for health and health and fitness. It's not only driving it's not driving us. You know, sports bras sales are going through the bloody roof as well. Lots and more. Everything to do with health and health and fitness. Um, that was the, that was the main one. I, I attribute it to um, to uh, to social media. That was the, uh, question then I don't know if I should open up that can of worms but um, if you were given the opportunity to um, uh, make the rules and um, deter Ram Raiders what would you put in place that you could see that would end that entirely because it doesn't seem like a it doesn't seem like a really good experience the one that you just went through really. it seems like a half measure you know before you get to before you get to the measures you've got to put a price of timeline but it's, it's, not a, it's not a smarty pants answer, but the first thing I'd do is I'd start 30 years ago, okay? Um, and it comes back to a whole lot of things that have added up to it with education, et cetera, et cetera, that's, uh, that's happened. So I'd start a long time ago with, um, with, with educating people. I'd take COVID away um, because there's been a big change. COVID took kids out of schools. Schools took a lot of discipline out of family life, and that's the most, um, that, that's some of the most important things. So, when you don't have disciplines in your life, you start acting the way you, you want. A lot of things that were unacceptable become acceptable. I don't know whether you've seen the um, the, the presentation by the American Army General when he when he talks about uh, making your bed in the morning. Just just mm -hmm. Google it. Okay, make that the first of a series of achievements for the day. Make your bed, and it's a it's a great presentation. Um, and that point with COVID, I think, that, and while it was it was dreadful being locked down, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, that point of of COVID taking away that routine of family life and that requirement of family life, I think that was a major one with, um, with, with kids. I mean, 40% of kids not attend. Rates of truancy of 40%? Mm -hmm. My God, no, that's, uh, that's, that's, that's not good at, um, at all. Um, and just get them get them involved in other organisations and what have you. Get them off this, get them out here, keep them doing stuff. Get them into a footy club, yeah. So footy, netball, hockey, whatever it is, but you know, let them be involved in the community because it's it's easy to go and steal from someone. It's a nameless, faceless thing. You know. mm. I'd like to think it's a bit different. They come and hey, this is Andrew's store. You know. 
물어보겠습니다. 자, 예. 태준배. 